Divers working for a salvage firm are descending into the cold waters of Lake Michigan. They reach the lake's bed and locate what a previous sonar scan has identified. It's the wreck of a World War II fighter plane, instantly recognizable. But how on earth did this relic of that conflict end up at the bottom of the lake? To fully understand this intriguing tale, we need to go back to the winter of 1941. The U.S. was not yet engaged in World War II, although that was soon to change. And what propelled the country into the conflict was, of course, the surprise attack by Japanese planes on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, on December 7, 1941. The impact of the 90-minute assault was devastating. The attack put no fewer than 18 ships out of action, destroyed close to 200 planes and damaged another 159. The human toll was equally grim. Almost 2,500 died, including sailors, airmen, soldiers, and civilians. Well, more than a thousand were injured. President Franklin Roosevelt signed a declaration of war on Japan the next day, and three days later, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy declared war on America. The country was now well and truly embroiled in World War II. But the losses at Pearl Harbor had severely reduced the military capabilities of the U.S., just at the time when they were most urgently needed. Training new pilots, especially airmen who could fly from carriers, was one prime concern. But after the attack on Pearl Harbor, which so exposed that base's vulnerabilities, where could they be trained in relative safety? Somewhere more or less immune to enemy air attacks and submarine torpedoes was desperately required. Japanese submarines were sailing up and down America's Pacific coast, while Nazi U-boats were present in the Atlantic waters in the Gulf of Mexico. A 2016 article in the Chicago Tribune credited a merchant seaman called John J. Manley with coming up with a solution to this knotty problem. Manley's bright idea was to use an inland body of water away from the threat of attack for aircraft carrier training. And where could be better than Lake Michigan? It is, after all, the only one of the five Great Lakes entirely located within U.S. borders, and it's big, covering more than 22,000 square miles. So Lake Michigan was ideal for the purpose. Big enough for meaningful training and as safe as could possibly be from enemy attack. There was another problem to be overcome, however. As World War II got underway for America, the U.S. Navy had seven aircraft carriers, but not a single one could be spared from active service for training purposes. So an alternative had to be found, and the chosen solution came in an unlikely shape of two steam-driven paddle-wheel passenger ships. The CNB had been launched in 1913, and the Greater Buffalo's maiden voyage had come in 1926. When the luxury-appointed C&B first launched, it had been the biggest inland paddle steamer in the world. But the Greater Buffalo then took that title when it appeared on the Great Lakes. Obviously, once the Navy got their hands on these two vessels, the ships needed a bit of work, to say the least, before they could be used to train pilots. The Navy started by renaming them, the C&B became USS Wolverine, and Greater Buffalo was now USS Sable. To convert the two pleasure steamers into training aircraft carriers, the Navy simply chopped off the superstructure that it didn't need and replaced it with a flight deck. The two vessels were now ready to start training pilots, and this would be an exacting learning curve. The training was made all the more difficult because Wolverine and Sable were not only lower in the water than a standard carrier, but also at 550 foot long, their flight decks were shorter by about a third. It's said that if a trainee could make the grade on these ships, then they could land on any flight deck in the U.S. Navy. Inevitably, training pilots to land on and take off from a ship results in mishaps and accidents. During the program of training from 1942 to 1945, there were more than 200 such incidents. Some of these resulted in the loss of planes, almost 130 in total. Mostly, the trainees suffered only minor wounds in these accidents, but sadly, there were eight deaths. The first was that of Ensign F. M. Cooper on October 21, 1942. While taking off from Wolverine in his F-4, F-3 Wildcat, he lost control of the aircraft and crashed it into the lake. Cooper and his plane were lost in close to 100 feet of water, never to be found. But those fatalities have been seen in the context of the fact that these brave young pilots managed a total of 120,000 incident-free landings on the Lake Michigan vessel and a staggering total of 35,000 men qualified as pilots after training on Sable and Wolverine. 
A few of the planes that crashed into Lake Michigan were recovered but mostly only those that landed in waters near the lake shores. So the majority of them were left where they ended up at the bottom of the lake. In recent years, however, there have been determined efforts to find these aircraft and almost 50 have since been hauled up from the lake bed. What's more, many of the planes that have been recovered from the depths are in a remarkable state of preservation. Leather seats and paint schemes are all in good condition, for example, and in some cases tires still have air and crankcases still hold their oil. This is because Lake Michigan consists of fresh water rather than salt water and its temperatures are low a Company called a and T recovery has been active in retrieving some of the sunken aircraft It uses an advanced form of sonar to find the planes a and T's general manager Taris listen explained the process to WSBT 22 in 2016 The sonar uses a sound wave and it listens for an echo return and draws an image of it. He said and a few of the planes that have been recovered from the lake have found a new home at the Air Zoo Museum in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Conservators and volunteers at the museum have already restored one of the aircraft and two more are currently going through the same process. Although the recovered planes have been in surprisingly good condition, those still in the lake are at grave risk from an introduced species, freshwater mussels. Think about all the other airplanes that are sitting at the bottom of the lake covered in these mussels. Air Zoo aircraft conservator Greg Ward told WSBT 22 now it's become almost an emergency to get funding and get these airplanes recovered before they get turned into dust underwater let's hope money can be found to save these extraordinary World War II planes check out these other videos from let me know if you haven't made the move to subscribe to our channel all you need to do is click on that red subscribe button thank you for watching